Let me first start with a bit of motivation. So I, I, I sort of spend some time developing software technology, other times developing AI for science, algorithms and things. I, I know we have a book coming out with 40 chapters on AI for science. Uh, it should be out in a few months. Good. A minor comment on this book, which is consistent with this meeting, is that if you look at the 40 chapters, 95% of the discussion is deep learning. It's, um, I don't think that's surprising at the moment. Deep learning may not be the answer, but anything that is the answer is likely to be more sophisticated and harder than deep learning. I don't think we'll go back to the previous type of AI. Um, a little comment, um, if you look at, if you, I read all those chapters and tried to write down all the things they needed and you can find uh, sort of uh, motifs or patterns of the AI and they're rather obvious, images, graphs, dense systems, time series, diffusion models, surrogate models, and um, you could imagine building foundation models that cover those particular patterns, and then they could be applicable to all fields. Like so one I know best is time series. You can build a, try to build a universal time series model, which I sort of try to do, and uh, map it to lots of different fields. And Stanford came up with this picture of what a foundation model is, which. Um, takes lots of data, learns a model, and then adapts it to different applications. And here we can finish by noting that we could have agriculture, which certainly has lots of image-based um, patterns and lots of time series. So images and time series were particularly important in that area. All right, now we're going to do uh, software systems. And then we'll start off with data engineering. And here is a picture of um, some data going through some pre-processing and then running through training and inference and then post-processing and um, going to output devices. And so I will call data engineering everything except the AI, the, the machine, the, which in this, as I pointed out, is dominantly deep learning. So um, if you look at the classical Jupyter Notebook, it starts off with lots of calls to NumPy and Pandas. Then it will invoke uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow and then get the answers and then use Matplotlib and things to process it. So the data engineering is everything except the um, TensorFlow and PyTorch. So I'll first briefly mention Cylon which is a project we originally started uh, when we realized that the um, systems like Spark and the associated systems were really not very high performance. And that was, even though I spent a lot of time actually trying to make Java more popular, uh, one of the problems is it's written in Java. So we wrote Cylon as a C++ kernel. It had one key technical idea, and that is to use Apache Arrow. Apache Arrow is an open source technology which is related to Apache Parquet, and they either do in-memory or disk-based high-performance arrays, vectorization of things. And um, Cylon is all, is, uses Arrow for every, every arithmetic operation. Also, all my students who worked on this project now work for a company, Voltron Data, which is devoted to making Arrow more commercially useful. They, they hired six of my staff and students, which are all scattered around the world, working on that. So here's an, I don't know whether, additional picture of the same basic idea that if we want to build a system, we have to integrate um, the data engineering steps, the data management steps with the deep learning. Um, and Cylon originally started off as the um, kernel of, of the Java system, but actually I'm not quite certain whether the Java systems have any role in the moment, because you can do anything that the Java system does in Python 
using pandas. And so our dominant use case now is sort of native Cylon invoked from Python. And Python links easier to Java, easier to C++ than, I mean, than um, Java. Okay. So Cylon is written to support parallelism for all these data engineering operations. And uh, we have a trivial idea, which is, well, which is very well established, which is to build the parallelism as libraries so the user does not have to invoke the parallelism explicitly. And um, so the, actually, this was when I used to work with Ken Kennedy at Rice University. That was the heart of high performance Fortran was a set of libraries to do the linear algebra automatically in parallel. So it's a similar idea. If you look at um, what you could make a library, here is some relevant components. Well, obviously MPI is a, a library that's got 720 different functions. Scalar plaque in one position has 320 functions. Pandas has 4,782 functions or operators, of which 224 are due to a Pandas opera, uh, data frame operations. Uh, NumPy has over 1,000 operators. And if you re look at TensorFlow and PyTorch, they're almost the same number of, parallel, of operators. So the idea, uh, the simple, the strategy is to just take these operators, which are then, which are typically invoked by the user as an operator, not as a, n n n not in any sort of loops and things like that, and you just parallelize them automatically. So the user invokes parallel operators, and so that's what Cylon is. It has a. Is it designed to support pandas? It has a table API because that's what pandas is affect. I mean, data frames are essentially tables, and um, it's I say Cylon is written in C++. It outperforms pandas sequentially because it uses Arrow. Arrow is much faster than the. You just use the native open source Arrow operators, and then faster than the standard pandas operators. And as we'll see, we can link it to other systems such as um, Dask and Ray and Radical Pilot and things like that. And um, as I mentioned in a question yesterday, we want to link this to MLIR for reasons I will discuss. Um, so if you look at these 224 operators, you will find that uh, the parallel structure falls into eight types. Um, the most simplest type is the embarrassingly parallel type. If you do uh, the operator which adds data frames together, that's embarrassingly parallel. Every addition could be done in parallel. So there are whole, lot, lots and lots of embarrassingly parallel. There are shuffle operators and uh, map, I mean, map produce operators and things like that. And um, so you, we found eight different motifs. And so we've implemented each of those motifs. And so given that, we can now, it's very mechanical to extend to all operators. Um, so here is some graphs for performance. And um, I won't go through these in detail. That There are a billion rows at the top, a billion table entries in the top, and 100 million in the bottom. And this makes uh, one point that um, we use UCX as the communication system of preference because it does not require you to use the MPI runtime because the MPI runtime stops you from using Ray and uh, distributed OSs like that. And this just compares various um, pandas operators running in parallel up to 512 um, tasks. And you will find that uh, UCX is the fastest Glue, which is the, one of the standard deep learning systems, is the somewhat slower, and MPI is in the middle, open MPI. And of course, these things all change with time. And also, the performance, of course, is um, better for a, a billion rows than it is for 100 million. And that difference gets more extreme as you go to higher parallelism. This is just standard behavior of parallel computing. Here are some strong scaling results for um, 
Various operators join, group buy and sort, again for 100 million and a billion rows. And it's, I don't really want to go through the detail, but Pandas, I mean, Cylon is always the lowest graph. It's much, it is always the fastest. And it is compared with uh, Dask, Spark, and Modin. Modin is always the slowest. And um, Spark is actually quite good at times. But it's actually not as fast as, as Cylon. Um, but Spark is, I mean, all these things get worked on. And Spark is getting improved every day because it has huge support. Um, so this uh, graph here is just the same type of um, performance, but it actually compares Cylon natively with Cylon implemented using the Berkeley operating system, Ray, which is a favorite operating system of the distributed computing community, and also the Python operating system, Dask. And uh, if you look at this graph, you will find that Cylon runs as fast on, the, on Slurm and MPR and standard HPC environments. It's equally high performance under Ray and Dusk. And that was because we can use UCX and it ha write a very careful uh, interface between UCX and, and Ray and Dusk. So this means we can run Cylon on clouds, where you'd na distributed clouds, where you'd naturally use Ray or on HPC clusters where you'd naturally use them. Uh, well, here's some results from um, Summit up to uh, 10,000 cores. And you can see for 50 billion rows, it's, the performance is quite reasonable. Anyway, these are just typical parallel computing um, numbers. Yes. No, this is not using GPUs. There is a GPU version, but uh, Actually, NVIDIA has a huge effort called Rapids devoted to GPU data frames. There is no reason anything I say wouldn't equally apply to GPUs. We just haven't done all the work on. We only have limited GPU support. Here is, um, we just finished this a week ago, which was to implement Cylon on Radical Pilot, because that's a standard HPC workflow system. And as we want to run a set of different MPI, if you like, Cylon jobs or data frame jobs, uh, we need to have a workflow system and on an HPC system that could be Radical Pilot. I, I'm sure we can use uh, Pegasus or Parcel as well. And uh, this is basically says that this, uh, this only goes up to 80 cores. But it essentially shows that uh, there, is, there is essentially no overhead from Radical Pilot. Now we make, that's the end of the data engineering. So now with Cylon, we have a, a support for data engineering, which is fully parallel, does it by parallelizing the operators, and it uses high performance uh, um, array for syntax using Apache Arrow. So now let's link with deep learning. Well, we've um, we, uh, had some nice, nice discussion with this already last night. Here's a, a plot that Rick Stevens once showed, pointing out that uh, uh, these uh, deep learning systems are very big. That's the red, red graph at the top there. And typically, it's done by industry, not academia. Here's some more. Here's a more detailed uh, plot of, of number of parameters versus um, not the, number, the size of the model versus the size of the data. And there are all sorts of numbers here going um, put here. And maybe here's a better graph, better table. And actually has the cost that if you use A100s that to, to train one of the largest, the Google Palm system, it costs um, nearly $7 million. But you, of course, have to do this once for each hyperparameter. And maybe you have 100 hyperparameters. So that's really almost a billion dollars for a realistic system. There's been a lot of discussion of chat GPT. So I found here a little discussion of the cost of running chat BGT. So it points out that Google spends $107 billion on the infrastructure for their search. That's just supporting search, just doing the current AI on search is $107 billion. 
you shouldn't feel too sorry for them. They get over 150 billion in payment for that service, so they make a huge profit. And then you can ask what it takes to um, run ChatGPT, and actually it doesn't cost much. It doesn't. It's, no, it's less than a billion dollars. So that's sort of quite interesting. That, uh, but this assumes you wouldn't run ChatGPT on all on all queries. And there are these huge number of queries here per day, 27 billion. And um, another interesting feature of this table is that. Uh, Sometimes you think of A100 as a state-of-the-art, but uh, uh, NVIDIA's H100, uh, I mean, the H100, the TPU V4, and the TPU V5 are all much faster than the A100. And the, if, the T, if these numbers for the TPU V5 are correct, it's five times faster than the A100. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, maybe the TPU is actually built to support linear algebra. It's not particularly support to do graphics as far as I know. And, and what's the source of these numbers? It's public information or? Well, it's called semi-analyst. There's a little logo here saying it's proprietary, which comes from this company called semi-analyst, which you can subscribe to. They have these pretty interesting detailed analysis of um, state of the art of semiconductors and software. Oh, and one important little comment here is that there's a growing use of what's called a, mix, a, a mixture of experts, and that's sort of, we'll see that's quite interesting, because mixture of experts requires more complicated processing, because you're only using part of the network to do any given training or inference. And uh, there's a Google paper pointing out that um, uh, a mix, a, 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 a mixture of experts model is much cheaper, to significantly cheaper to train and to do inference. And, um, and that's partly because although it's seven times bigger than GPT-3, it uses less tokens than GPT-3 has on any one um, invocation because as, as is a mixture of experts, it only chooses one of the experts to execute. And there are 64 experts in this in this um, model. So it's just divide, the model's di divided into a whole set of sub-networks that then invokes a particular network for a particular query. Okay. So that says we have to worry about a mixture of experts. Here's a comment on performance. I do a lot of work with MLPerf, which is an industry consortium doing benchmarking. And uh, if you look at their latest training results, <coughs> Um, you, can, uh, you can do something trivial, which used to be done all the time, then you look at efficiency. And um, if you look at the efficiency, it's pretty terrible. I mean, uh, there are results from Google and NVIDIA, up to 4,000 TPUs or GPUs, but the efficiency there is um, less than 20%. So that says you're not going to use 4,000 GPUs on any practical problem. That will be a, especially if you have 27 billion runs to make, you're going to run lots of jobs. And so the largest number of GPUs anyone, or TPUs any one job would use is maybe 512 or some number like that. Even that's not so, that's only 50% efficient. These numbers also, by the way, again have the TPU V4 faster than the A100 and the hopper much faster than the A100. Those are published ML perf results. So all this means is that uh, when you're going to uh, use a supercomputer to do AI, like Frontier, you're not going to use all 37,888 GPUs on one job. You're going to have to run lots of jobs, because you would be foolish to, to run in such a low efficiency. So that's a little different from simulation jobs, which can use large number of GPUs efficiently. And these... Um, Tests that are on ResNet and BERT, which are classic image processing and language models. So I think they're reasonably realistic. So we deduce from this that uh, we better run support several jobs. So now let's come to that. So we have to ask whether there's any point in parallel data engineering. That's what I started with, and this is a little worrisome, which is why we come to the next section of the talk, because 
if you look at the deep learning jobs, at least the ones I run, 95% of the execution time is in the deep learning part. It is not in the pandas part. So we've efficiently spread out pandas, but that was only a small part of the, pro pro the problem. Notice most of the code is in pandas, at least in my, my, my codes, which I write, because there's a lot of screwing around with visualization and pre-processing. Um, so in order to have an, any effective system, you better worry about the deep learning part. And that's not so easy to do because of the, mono, the giant systems, TensorFlow and PyTorch, which uh, can be modified by users, but are not so trivial. Another important uh, difficulty here is that uh, I.O. is, very imp is ve even more important in deep learning than pandas because in um, deep learning you have to, you have to uh, read and write the models every step and also the data is read every epoch but it's also shuffled and that produces a huge amount of I.O. movement. So many deep learning jobs require lots of not just parallelism from the from the CPU, or from the CPU and GPU, but they also require very effective uh, movement of data and assignment of data to storage. Um, I, I should note MLIR is used extensively, at least by uh, some uh, some vendors in in the deep learning systems. Um, it's used extensively in OpenXLA, which is the Google's version of. Uh, I guess it's Slate, I mean, or, Sc or Scalar Pack. It's the um, parallel linear algebra. X stands for extreme, LA for linear algebra. And it's built on MLIR. And um, we need to try to see, understand, therefore, how to use these various systems. If you, and um, I will mention, maybe well, I can start here and mention pathways. There's a recent, to me, inspirational paper by Google, Jeff Dean, on called Pathways at the last ML Sys conference. And uh, that breaks up deep learning into lots and lots of components so that you can do these things like optimize mixture of experts. And he, they, uh, uh, I will summarize that soon. So here is, a, a, this picture comes from, um, the pathways paper, and um, it points it shows the basic structure of the challenge. You have some sort of data flow program, which has got just three components in this picture on the left, ABC. Then you need to decompose that data flow onto a set of what they call islands, and we would call an island an MPI job. These papers never mention MPI. They refuse to mention MPI, except they clearly use MPI. As far as I know, MPI is fast. I told you, Glue, is my, which is Facebook, one of Facebook's technologies, is significantly slower than MPI. Um, and um, UCX is, seems to me the most attractive, and as far as I know, it outperforms other systems, except possibly Google. But Google's are all proprietary, and so you can't find out what they are doing. Um, anyway, so the basic model is a whole bunch of what they call islands, which I call MPI jobs. And you have to dynamically uh, or statically assign those islands to the available machines. And you have, then if we, if we were using Frontier, we might have 100 AI jobs, because we wanted to keep the number of GPUs less than 512. And we might so have 100 um, jobs. Each of those jobs is broken up into lots of different components. And let's see what those are. Well, let's first look at the parallelism in deep learning. So for somebody like me who started in parallel computing, deep learning is the world's most wonderful parallel computing problem because it has five forms of parallelism. There is data parallelism, we chop up the data. There is model parallelism, we chop up the model. That's classic nearest neighbor and all that type of stuff, at least for convolutional neural nets, it's the nearest neighbor. Um, the next form of parallelism is layer parallelism or pipeline parallelism. You're running it through a lot of layers, each of the, and you can do that in a pipeline on different machines. Uh, the, let's do the last one shown on this thing, which is hyperparameter search, 
I pointed out a typical, at least commercial job might have 100 different hyperparameter values to look at, so that's a factor of 100. And the last one is shown here. That is expert parallelism, which is, I pointed out that uh, these modern highest performance deep learning models have a mixture of experts. 64 was a, a typical number, 64, 128. Uh, 128 is the largest I've seen in a discussion, but it's probably not the largest used. So we have five forms of parallelism, and there's lots of interesting work trying to automate the choice of which form of parallelism to use. So you can assume there's a complex uh, program which decides, makes performance models, and chooses the right parallelism. So then I would propose that the, this is what we're trying to do. We need to look at deep learning and the same philosophy of operators. <clears throat> so what's a typical operator? Well, that's an obvious one is shuffle. We need to shuffle the data. And um, another one is batching. We have various operators which move the data around and assign the, assign the data to, to appropriate uh, MVME and uh, memory and things. Um, we have to go between vectors and tensors. We have to calculate the forward loss, the back propagation loss. There is a technology from Google here to JAX, which is useful there. We have to save the model. And we have all sorts of um, standard operators because well, of the, the tensors being manipulated. And um, so this is what the Google pathways basically within a rather obscure proprietary fashion describes that type of uh, decomposition. And as far as I can see, it's reasonably straightforward to do. And it is in the same philosophy as I described for data engineering. So what we're trying to do is to, um, is to effectively try to do pathways in an open source fashion. Pathways use the Google workflow engine called Plaque which I have not known, I, as far as I know, is not known to anybody outside Google. And um, they claim it will run on Ray, which uh, we do know, which is open source. I carefully pointed out we can use Ray effectively to run on any system. And we now need to, so our proposal is to at least either support Ray to run on clouds or HPC workflow systems to run on, on supercomputers. We have the data engineering already done. We have to run lots of these jobs, as I've explained. We will specify the program in MLIR, uh, to, so to specify a general data flow graph, which all these things are. I mean, Spark pioneered the use of data flow graphs, but uh, if you look at TensorFlow and PyTorch, they are just data flow graphs. Now, a non-trivial problem, which I don't quite know how to best to do, is to specify the hardware. There doesn't seem to be an agreed ontology to specify the hardware you want to map to, but if you want to write a general mapping program, you better have a specification of the hardware. And then we have the uh, MLIR-based runtime compiler. And although this pathways are static, I don't see why we shouldn't do it and don't need to do it dynamically. And we, also, we will continue to support Arrow and Parquet. Parquet for the disk and Arrow for the uh, memory operations. Here is just a trivial, one of my students did a little test on Parquet, and it has the size on disk on the left and the time to read on the right. And Arrow and Parquet are much the fastest on the right, and Parquet is much the smallest on the left. So using Parquet, I, I would say things like HDF5, they ought to be integrated with Parquet. I don't quite know why they're not. Parquet is a standard open source technology. And um, I say it's integrated with Arrow, and Arrow certainly works very effectively, as I've already shown. And here's the last slide. So as I started, we can uh, hope that I'm sure AI for science will uh, be transformative. And um, I think we should look at foundation models. If you, like ML Puff, which I work with, is full of HPC PhD students um, who, are, who are staffing all the HPC uh, people at these co in these companies. And I told you how data engineering can be paralyzed with a library of parallel operators. 
deep learning uh, is starting to have a flexible parallelization scheme, and we, we would propose to integrate it uh, and probably use MLIR to do that. Thank you.